everybody. It looks like we have a really, really fabulous crowd here today. So, so glad everybody can join us. Um, hoping as always that everyone is doing well, staying healthy and finding manageable ways of coping with the quarantine life. So today we're very lucky to have Arlene, Arlene Correa Valencia joining us here in this virtual space to have a deeper discussion about her life and her work. Um, Arlene Correa Valencia is a current MFA candidate at California College of the Arts. She was born in Arteaga, Michoacan, Mexico and emigrated to Napa in 1997. In 2019, Arlene was a finalist for the AXA Art Prize, received the William and Gloria Brobeck Scholarship in Graduate Fine Arts, and held the notable solo exhibition Invisible at Cal Maritime Community Art Gallery in Vallejo. Previous internships and residencies include Freeze Art Fair, New York, Duke Riley Studio in Brooklyn, and the ICAD New York Studio Residency Program in New York. She currently has work on view in the Come to Your Census, Who Counts in America, exhibition at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. I'd also like to mention that Arlene's lecture and visit with us are made possible in part by the co-sponsorship of the DeRosa Center for Contemporary Art. While the DeRosa is tempor temporarily closed to the public due to the pandemic, it, its staff is working to make current exhibitions more accessible online. So Arlene, thank you again so much for sharing your powerful story and work with us um, in the video lecture you made um, and for being here with us today. I've received a lot of questions for you from our students, um, so I'll be trying to weave them together into a conversation here. But I'd like to start by just asking, how are you doing and how are you coping with quarantine? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much everyone that for everyone that's joining us and I'm so happy to see so many names pop up on my screen. Um, it's just really surreal too. to I grew up in Napa and to, you know, be a part of a conversation at Sonoma State. Just such, like that's incredible. I'm just super honored. And so thank you for having me here. Um, and with this whole pandemic that's happening, it's been, you know, really difficult because obviously, as I've shared with you guys, my family and I are undocumented. And so when crises like these happen, um, we have to rearrange and readjust the way that we function as everyone else does. Uh, but for us, it's a little bit more extreme and personal. And, um, it, you know, if you get down to the nitty gritty of it, we don't qualify for a lot of things that normal people do. And so it's been really tough, but I'm, we're super grateful and really happy to be healthy, first of all, and to be together with my family. And so as long as those two things are in place, nothing can really go wrong. That's good to hear. Um, so you have a really powerful personal story, which is at the core, it seems, of, of most or all of the work you do. Um, and as you said in your lecture and restated now, um, you arrived in the States from Mexico at the age of three, grew up locally in Napa Valley, and really came face to face with the consequences of being an un undocumented person in high school when your friends uh, were all having what many people take for granted as rites of passage, like getting a driver's license. Um, can you walk us through this moment in your life a bit more and especially how art making figured into that experience? Yeah, of course. So I guess I, and I get asked this a lot, you know, like when was the first time you realized you were undocumented? Um, and I think I always knew because as a family, and I'm sure that many um, Latinx and, and undocumented communities function in the same way, as a family, there was always a sense of protection that was more than the normal, right? So uh, as a normal parent, you don't want your kid to fall down and scrape his knees. But the way that our parents protected us was even beyond that right? It was even more sheltered than the normal child because of the, the very real consequences that we could suffer socially and politically. Um, and so, you know, of course, at 15, everyone's getting a license. And then I, I just knew that that wasn't a thing for me because it wasn't something that my older brother was able to do either. And so it's, I expected it. I knew it was coming. Um, but it still hits a totally different way when you're actually going through it. And then obviously wanting to go to college was another extreme thing that I had to overcome um, and, and work around it. And I think I just personally have an extremely stubborn personality. Um, and I, I love when people say no to me. And I love when, when people are like, nope, that's not for you. You don't qualify. I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm going to make myself qualified. I'm going to push through this. And so that the challenges that I face in my life are very extreme, but like they make me really happy. And it's almost like I, I get off on that 
that adrenaline of not knowing whether or not I will be able to achieve something, but knowing that I'm putting my entire life into it. And then art making comes in because as an undocumented family and household, uh, that we played very traditional roles. And so my father was disconnected from uh, us kids and he played the role of just going to work and providing for the family and making sure there was food on the table. And, and he had a connection with my older brother that he didn't have with me because he was the, the male, um, the first born male. And me being the first female that I was not tapped into whatever masculine energy they had. And so again, I wanted to break that barrier down and I realized that I could do that through painting. So my father taught himself how to paint at a very young age and he's very interested in the arts. And I knew that if I connected with him in a painting language that I would be able to, to break that barrier down and to have a deeper, deeper connection to him. And so that, that's where the painting comes in, into my life is really at an early age and wanting to connect with my father. And there was moments in, in my teenage life where I was like, I hate painting, I, I, you know, rebellious, like I have want nothing to do with my dad. I'm never going to be a painter. But then as I traversed these challenges of being undocumented and of course not being able to go to art school right away, um, I realized in, at the Napa Valley Community College when I was making art that I, that was the happiest I was, right? I was coming into the studio at 7 a.m. and leaving until they kicked me out of the building. And in that, I realized that I'd never, I didn't have much to tell other than the frustrations that I felt surrounding my, my immigration status. And so I think it was in 2015, 2016, that there was a moment where Joe Arpaio in Arizona was, you know, taking over these tent cities and creating these encampments for, for brown undocumented migrants. And I just remember feeling this, like, just fury and anger of like, oh my gosh, this is, what my family has had to go through. This is what my parents have been fighting for. And I have to make something out of it. And so in 2006, no, that was earlier, like 2014, I think, I made my first like actual political piece speaking about Jor Pio and Tent City. Um, and I was really excited at that. And that was like the first fire that just like went off in my brain. And I was like, this is what I'm making work about. This is what I know the most intimately. And I'm going to use this to channel all of these frustrations of, of my status um, as a way to be heard and as a way to be seen. And I, I guess, I mean, I guess you're already kind of answering this, but I want to say while, while I can't ask all the questions that were asked of you, I can maybe share some with you later, but um, I was I was impacted by reading the questions to you because a lot of, of our students were personally impacted by your studio because they themselves have experienced um, growing up in the area as an undocumented persons as well. Um, and uh, so I wanted to take from a couple of those. Um, and one person asked if you could talk more about what exactly it took to overcome, as you say, your shame and fear of sharing your personal political position and coming out as undo undocumented, and what your advice would be to a person whose family does not always encourage them um, to be in school or especially in the arts? Yeah, so that is a really heavy and tricky question because I, and I'll share, a I, obviously I, I wish I had advice on the right way and the proper way to deal with all of these issues. But ultimately, I feel like you have to do what's right for you. And I've known many undocumented people that wanted to pursue the arts, but because they end up, you know, having to choose between a job that will feed their parents and their siblings or art school, it, it gets really complicated. Um, I myself struggled a lot um, with my parents accepting the fact that I wanted to talk about this publicly. And my parents to this day are still very worried about the consequences of me speaking very openly about my immigration status. Um, and it's also something that I feared very much. And so it wasn't, and I, I don't, I'm not sure if I shared this in the lecture, but it wasn't until I went to New York and I was written about on hyperallergic for the first time that I really came out. And I remember that night that I met Seth Rodney, the writer at Howard Hyperallergic, I remember no, like thinking and walking in Manhattan, just like at 2 a.m., walking the street and thinking, okay, if I call this guy in the morning, I know what he's going to ask me. I know he's gonna want the, he's gonna want the full story. And if I call him, 
I have to be real. I have to be honest. I have to be completely open. But if I don't call him, I'm protecting myself and it's probably not going to help my career. You know, it's like uh, one, I'm not going to be able to move forward with being an artist. Um, and, and I, I just remember like walking circles around Manhattan, basically thinking, wondering like, am I calling this guy in the morning? What is hat? Like, what I don't know what I'm going to do. But then I called my dad and I said, dad, this guy wants to do this interview and you know, he's going to ask about all these things. And he basically said, listen, I can't tell you what to do. Um, and he, and my, my father is really open and really honest. And we, now we have such a beautiful dialogue. And so he just said, I can't tell you what to do, but know that, you know, I want the best for you. And if you want to be an artist that talks about these political issues, then go ahead and do it, but you have to do it all the way. You can't, you know, dip your toes in and then back out when it's scary. He said, if you call him, you have to go all the way. Um, and I don't want to hear you, you know, I don't want to hear you complain about it. I want to, you have to embrace it. You have to know that this is going to be the, what sets the tone for you for the rest of your life, essentially. And so I came out as undocumented, which is such a weird term because usually it's used in, in the LGBTQ community to come out um, uh, in a different way, you know, sexually. But it, it also, to come out politically is something that, I don't think we've had many conversations about that should be had because it is important to let go of that part of yourself. And I know that when I did it, I felt such release. Like I, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but I just felt like I, I could breathe again. And exactly when the article came out, I was actually working for Duke Riley in his studio in Brooklyn. And I remember um, getting the email that the article was out and it was right around the time that, um, the, we were having all the conversations around appropriation with the 2017 Whitney Biennial um, with Dana Schutz. And so I, my picture, you know, it was like my article next to Dana Schutz's article on hyperallergic. And I just remember thinking like, oh my God, holy shit. Like this is, this is taking the reels. Like if we want to take over appropriation and we want to take control of our own narrative, this is what it takes. You know, it takes being that person that is willing to share their story, willing to come out and put themselves on the front lines so that this other thing doesn't happen, right? So that Dana Schutz and, and this, this whole empire doesn't take over our narrative. And so I, I, I opened the article and I just started crying and my coworkers were like, are you okay? What's wrong? And I was just like, oh my God, what did I do? What did I do? But and now looking back at it, it was the best decision that I could have done for me. Um, it was what I needed to do to be able to release all the anger and frustrations that I have um, of from being in this position because now, and now it doesn't seem so big, right? So when I introduce myself to someone and I say, oh, I'm an artist and they're, you know, they obviously ask, so what, what do you make work about? And I say, well, I'm undocumented and blah, blah, blah. This is what I make work about. And, and it doesn't even hurt anymore. Right. And so for years and years and years, I was so afraid of the way that people might judge me. I was so afraid of what people might think of me if they thought, you know, I was a, all the preconceived notions that they could have had of me because I was undocumented, those no longer exist. Um, I say I'm undocumented and I'm proud of it. You know, I'm extremely proud and I own it and this is who I am. And I can't imagine a life where I was not undocumented because it's taught me everything I need to know about myself and my culture and um, what, what the boundaries that I'm willing to push personally within my work and within my personal life. So I would just say, um, do what's right for you. And I know the answers aren't always there, but I do a lot of drawing and writing and sketching and that usually helps. And years later, I look back into what I was writing about and I'm like, oh, there was, you know, the answer was there all along. I just didn't see it clearly. So I don't know if that's helpful at all, but, you know, everyone has a different trajectory of how they, how they handle um, their, their legal status. But, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of. And one of my, my biggest takeaway is knowing that because I came out, I took that fear away from my siblings and I take that fear away from my community. And they, so one of the biggest things is my, my siblings are not vocal about their legal status at all, but they, but I know that they no longer feel that shame because they see how proud I am of who we are. 
and they see that I put them on this platform and I make paintings of them and I make them into art objects. And so they see themselves reflected in a way that they that society doesn't show them, right? And so to me, that's worth everything. Like that's worth absolutely everything. If I can make my family feel more comfortable in their own skin and who with the, who they are, then I've accomplished everything. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's so beautifully said, thank you. Um, I'd love to get back. I, I'm planning actually on <laughs> getting back to the topic of the 27 biennial and uh, 2017 biennial and sorry, wait, yes, 17. Um, and the, the idea of authorship and authenticity. Um, first, though, I, because it's still connected to what you're talking about right now, um, a question about um, work that uh, overtly addresses sociopolitical concerns. Um, what do you believe art can do that other professions or actions say, you know, being a lawyer, a social worker, a policymaker cannot? Yeah, well, uh, that's a good question because I feel like we all play a different role, right? We need the attorneys, we need the social workers, we need, um, I know that I have my network of people that work with me and I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without them. Right, and so I think that everyone is essential in, in their own way and they contribute to the bigger fight. Um, so I would never wanna take away from, from all the different positions that it takes to fight for our people. But I do think that art is therapeutic in a way um, that the other things might not be. And so for me, ma making art is more powerful than, than being an attorney or, or, or whatnot just because I, I know that I can work with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so one of my favorite things is to do workshops with, um, with children or with families or whatever you call it. I love doing that. And I think that there's a magical moment that happens in teaching someone how to paint the color of their skin or how to reflect on their journey. Um, and, and I don't know that it's accessible in, in, in another field. I just know that this is the way that I was able to create those magical moments with my dad and I try to reflect them um, in all of the work that I do in my community. So for me, that's, I think maybe that's more of like a personal question. I think that for me, um, art makes it, and depending on the kind of work that you're making, you can make it accessible for absolutely anyone um, to be able to tap into it in very different ways. And so one of the things that I talked about in my MFA review yesterday was about how there's two different audiences for my work. And so one, you know, the first audience, I guess, because it, it, and I, I'm very, um, I'm very transparent about the fact that I do want to be shown in galleries. I do want to, you know, be in art fairs or whatever, but only because that is the, the way that the market functions to be able to to fund the other things that I want to do. And so a lot of my other projects are very socially engaged. They, you know, engage with the community. The project that I'm working on now with YBCA um, for the census is one that I'm extremely proud of. And I've been able to work with a lot of community members and bringing it to the mission, bringing it to the Napa Valley, um, Napa Vallejo flea market. And so, you know, that's obviously not a gallery setting, but it, it but it, it's, it can happen because of the art market. Um, and so really knowing, knowing the audience is really important. And, and for me, I know that I can achieve both, but those magical moments only really truly happen with the community. And that's why art is important. It, it's my tool of being able to connect with others. Got it. Um, can, let's go to that, that issue of, um, authenticity and authorship. Um, you said that in, in your lecture that when you were in New York, just context for anybody who maybe wasn't able to see the lecture, um, that you saw a lot of work about the immigrant and undocumented person's experience, um, that it was almost a kind of a popular theme, but that it really angered you to see someone who hasn't had that experience speaking for you. Um, and so a lot of the questions that, that I, I got or you got um, circled around this issue of authorship, authenticity, and who has the right or ethical responsibility of telling someone else's story. So um, one of these questions was, um, what, what does authenticity in a work of art really mean? And why, should so why shouldn't someone be able to explore someone else's story in a work of art? 
could you talk a little more about this critical conversation? Sure. And I, you know, I think it's a very complicated conversation. Um, and it, I don't think that we're going to stop having this conversation for many years to come. Um, and I think that the Whitney Biennial in 2017 was amazing because it did start that conversation. And while I don't agree with that painting and I don't agree um, with what the artist did at all, I, I do appreciate the fact that it planted the seeds to be able to have these conversations. Um, I personally don't think that I could ever take on anyone else's narrative only because I know that my own narrative has nuances that no one else could ever explain or could, could ever explain and could ever understand, right? Um, I'm married to an American citizen and this is like super personal, but he's, he's Salvadoran. Um, and so I'm Mexican and although we're both Latinx people, um, we share different, like very different cultural roots. Um, and e our languages are even different, right? And my husband is not undocumented, obviously, and he has never been. Um, and even with my husband, who I've been with for 11 years, we have arguments because he doesn't understand my frustrations. He doesn't understand my position, right? He doesn't understand why I'm more sensitive to crises like what we're going through today or why, you know, um, the lights going out really scare me or why all the doors in our house have to be locked, or there's certain nuances to my experience that he himself will never understand. And I think that he's the closest person to me. So now if we're talking about someone else who has a completely different skin color, who grew up you know, in a middle class to upper class, whatever, and wants to talk about my experience and wants to give voice to something that I've gone through, I think it's extremely far removed. I think that there's, you know, I, I, I think empathy is huge and I think we should always be empathetic towards other people and we should definitely try to be, um, try to imagine ourselves in their shoes and try to think about what it would be like to go through their experiences, but I'd never, ever, ever would recommend putting ourselves in a place where we are giving voice to something that we've never experienced. And when it comes to art, for me, I think, you know, when I walked into the Whitney and I saw these giant paintings of brown men, I knew automatically there was something in the, in the, in the texture of the paint, in the strokes, in the, in the thickness of the, the paint and in the way that the, the facial features were expressed, that I knew that whoever was painting them was not investigating the skin color in the same way that I try to look for those like sunburnt marks from, from my father working out in the sun all day, right? There was a way in which, I, and maybe this is like me reading way too much into it, but I just felt like the paint was laid on in a way that it was being manufactured to produce a spectacle, right? It was being manufactured to, to be a part of a conversation. And there was no deep investigation of what it means to be kissed by the sun for 15 hours while harvesting grapes in Napa Valley, right? There was no, there was no exploration of those nuances. And I, and, and I just knew it right away, right? I walked in, I saw this painting and I was like, that's not, that's not a brown person painting a brown person. That's someone wanting to take on that story. And to me, that's just disrespectful because I, I guess I see the pain in my father's eyes and my mom's eyes of all the sacrifices that they've made for, for me to be able to be, be speaking to all of you today, right? For me to be, to have an education, to be the first person in my family ever to have a master's degree, a college degree at that. And so when you get rid of that richness in the history, you're eliminating 90% of the story. Right, so no matter what you're trying to tell, you're not ever going to get to this, the, the beauty, and again, this like magical moment of being able to encapsulate something so precious and so beautiful um, that needs to be honored. And I think that we all have to make those decisions when we walk into our studio and we have to, when we start making work, we have to decide what we want to do and what we're willing to take on. And it doesn't mean that, you know, if that you're white, middle class, upper class, that you don't have something to say. I think everyone in this world has something to say. 
and we just have to figure out what that is so that we can do it in the best way possible um, without speaking for anyone else. And I think that I will always stand very um, opinionated on, on this issue because I know what it's like to be spoken for. And I, I've had um, many, very many instances where people have even tried to speak for me in a conversation. And they're like, oh, no, 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 like Arlene's gone through all these things, right? And, and that doesn't feel good. And so if in a, in a public conversation, someone tries to belittle you because of your social political position, um, it, it, taking it into art is just like taking it into the next level. And I don't, I don't agree with that. You know, just when it comes right down to it, I don't believe in that. I don't agree with that. I don't think that we should ever speak for anybody um, regardless of who they are. If they have a, like a, a vocal accord in them to speak, we should allow them to speak regardless of what that sounds like. Mm -hmm. and, and just to, to clarify, um, you did talk about it briefly, but the painting that Dana Schutz made that you're referencing was a painting of Emmett Till. Correct. Uh, and the, based on the photograph that Emmett Till's mother gave to the press to publicize the brutal murder of her of her child. Um, and I, I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but just because it's such a pressing and critical conversation happening right now, um, I, I, I believe that one of the statements she made once the, you know, there was real pushback against the painting being in the biennial was that she was identifying, she, that she was identifying with the mother. Um, what, you know, and what would you say to that? I think uh, we can all make the argument that we're human beings and we identify with each other as human beings. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't give us the right to take on such a political issue when we know that, you know, the past, the past few years of our society have very, very, have been very focused on brown and black bodies and the policing of brown and black, black uh, sorry, brown and black bodies um, and everything that we've been going through it, it was just a very timely thing to say, um, I'm a mother, she's a mother, you know, uh, and, and I don't believe it. And you're, I mean, and you're also making a point about misrepresentation, that she was representing another body and misrepresenting it because of her inability to, to really have had that experience to present or represent, I guess. Anyway, I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> you said it beautifully, so we'll just move on. <laughs> um, so, okay, so so to switch gears a little bit here, um, the fires in the Napa Sonoma region deeply affected many, or I would say most, of the community here at Sonoma State University. So, the work you made on this topic really hit a chord for a lot of our students. Um, many have asked about the process of conceiving of and making these paintings. So I just wanted to present you with a few. Um, one student writes, I really appreciate how you discovered your voice for undocument undocumented people through your artwork. It was really liberating hearing how you discovered that it is nothing to be ashamed about and how it created a whole new language within your work. When you speak of no one is documenting the undocumented, do you yourself conduct any interviews with the workers um, personal, do you have personal conversations or are you simply observing them from a distance to respect boundaries? Also, have you ever had a problem going into these vineyards late at night? Um, are you granted permission? So a lot, of, a lot of people were really curious about that process of, you know, you talked about photographing, you shared some of the photographs with us, really powerful. So can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so um, I'll just start off by t like telling you all about my connection to, to the grape. Um, really into growing up in Napa. So when I first came to this country, I was living in a two bedroom apartment with a lot of my uncles and aunts and my mom and my parents and my family, obviously. Um, and my first memory of knowing that we were centered in Napa Valley was one of my, my great uncle coming home with a little like dollop of grapes. Um, and he pinned them to the wall and just said, you know, they're going to turn into raisins and they'll be sweet one day. You just have to wait. And so I remember as, as a child that we had to wait for these grapes to turn into raisins and then we could snack on them. Um, later on, you know, you learn about all the like really messed up um, nuances of, of wine country and what the labor industry here entitles. 
And so I guess when the fires came, I had always just been interested in this imagery of labor um, and specifically connecting it to my parents' labor, labor here in the Valley. And so my process is I, I do go into the, to the wineries and into the, um, the field with permission. Um, I'm very connected. I, so I grew up in Napa, and so I'll have a lot of friends in the wine industry. And I'm really, really grateful that they allow me to have access to that because I know documenting workers is something that is really hard to come by just because people don't want to get caught um, with uh, labor conditions that are not appropriate or I'm not you know, up to code. Um, and every time I approach someone or before I photograph anyone, I introduce myself and I have a conversation with them. And for me, it's been really, really um, amazing and really powerful to get to know the subjects that I work with because I don't feel like, like I said before, I can't, I, I'm bringing to the foreground what uh, my own history and my parents' migration, um, but I don't know their own story. And I think that I meet them somewhere in the middle because one, I'm obviously interested in this labor because of who I am, but I also want to know who they are, right? And I want to make sure that by in painting them, I, I honor their wishes. And so a lot of my paintings don't have actual faces because people don't want to be seen, but they still want to be photographed, you know, but they don't actually want to be recognized. Um, I always ask for names, but if people aren't comfortable with it, I say, hey, you know, if you don't have to give me your name, I don't have to title this painting by your name. I could title it something else. You, uh, like if you want nothing to do with me, you don't have to have anything to do with me. Um, but if you want to look me up, here's my information. Here's my website. This is how you can contact me, whatever. Um, and so I always try to keep access open, but also closed if that's what they wish to do. Uh, I, I think it was last year I filmed with KQED and they did a piece on exactly what I did during the fires and what I'm working on now. Um, and we actually did run into trouble in the fields. Um, and that was the first time that I ha it had gotten complicated for me, but I also understood exactly what happened and why it happened. And it was actually because the president had just announced that there would be more ratings and, and um, more raids and that they, the ice would be out. And, you know, when it comes to Napa, we're extremely targeted because we are a huge um, labor industry that relies a lot on a lot of migrant and undocumented work. And so that day, I didn't really think much of it. I didn't think it would be a problem. We ended up going out and we started filming. The first few people didn't give me, you know, any trouble. They were super, open they we talked a lot we joked we i mean i'm i'm i really like to dive deep into what i'm doing um and so i give them my all i tell them my whole story they tell me their story we laugh and we you know run up and down the fields and it's really fun and it wasn't until i reached this this older lady who um maybe she was like around my mother's age and i approached her and she covered her face and I said, hey, I'm Arlene, um, I'm an artist, and this is what I make work about. Uh, you know, I'm working on the series. Would it be okay if you know, this filmmaker is taking video? And she just said, no, thank you, puts her head down and she says, no, no, gracias. Um, and I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, thank you so much. And I walked away and I went to the next row. And then um, when I was talking to the next person, the guy I was working with overheard the, the previous lady talk to someone else and she said to her, um, don't give them your name when they come around, don't talk to them, they're probably with ICE. Mm -hmm. um, and when I heard that, I think my heart just sunk, you know, like I couldn't even breathe. And so automatically I just said, hey, shut the cameras off, go get in the car, we're done. I was like, we are totally done. And of course the filmmaker is like, no, 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 this is great, we should film it. And I was like, hell no, I was like, absolutely not. If like if you film this and I'm out, like, I don't care if I signed a contract, like I'm totally out, you know, I was like, get in the car. We're absolutely done. Wait for me over there. And so I was angry because obviously this is what the industry wants to see. This is what they want to get on video. Right. But for me, I felt like I would never want to inflict that kind of fear into anybody because I know exactly what it feels like to be scared to that point. Right. 
So I walked over to this lady again and I said, hey, ma'am, in Spanish, of course, I was like, I overheard what you said. And, and I started crying because I was just like, I was so in so much of my own pain, knowing that I could be put in that position. And I said, listen, um, I would never want to make you feel that way because I know what it feels like. I was like, and I'm just as scared as you are. And I said, I'm undocumented. You might not believe me or you might not care or whatever, but I know what it's like to be in your position. And I'm really sorry that we triggered that in you. Um, the cameras are off. We're leaving. I promise you'll never see me again. I was, I was like, you have nothing to worry about. Um, and I just apologized. And she said, oh no, Mija, like, I'm so sorry. It's just that we're so scared. I was like, no, please do not apologize to me. Like, I'm sorry that I did this to you. Um, and, and I just shut things off. You know, we hugged and I cried and I left and we got into the car and we drove off. And of course the filmmakers like, we should have gotten that on video. It was so good. I was like, no, absolutely. There's boundaries. Right. And so that's what I think is important for me in my work is knowing that there's boundaries between how much I'm willing to show and how much I'm willing to keep to myself. And if we have no boundaries, and if I would have let that be recorded, I'm not honoring my parents. And ultimately, that's what I want to do. I want to make sure that I'm honoring my mother and my father for everything they've done for me. And although that lady was not my mother, I see my mother reflected in her. And um, that was a great learning experience for me because maybe I could do something different. Maybe I could, the way that I approach people could be different. And I think that language plays a huge role in that, right? Had I only spoken English, it would have been a very different conversation. Um, and it probably would have been more intense, but I spoke her language. I knew how to connect and I was sensitive. And so I think that's something to keep in mind when we're working with other people and we're bringing in different communities into our work is, learning how to, to be sensitive and how to pick up on the cues of what is right and what is wrong to do in our work. And, and to the question about the audience of your work, do any of the people that you've made the paintings of, do they, do they get to see the paintings in the end? I mean, how does that work out? Yeah, they do actually. So that's been really great because I've had a lot of people that are interested, you know, and they're like, oh, wow, you're a painter. Like, that's such an honor for our community to have a painter. Um, and so they end up following me on Instagram or finding me online and they are super excited and, and really happy. Um, and I've actually never painted my father, but I feel like he sees himself reflected in every painting. So that, that, that pride is so beautiful. Um, and I think you know, we see a lot of traditional European paintings at every museum, but we never see brown bodies. Um, I think we are starting to a lot more now, which is great, but it's really been a slow shift in trying to make that happen and establishing ourselves in, in those environments and making sure that we are reflected. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, this the, here's a question that I think is connected right here. So um, when you talked about the early portraits that you made on the brown paper, um, I think those are the ones you were saying you presented to Ana Teresa Fernandez and she suggested more color and you were like, no, is that, am I getting yeah. this right? Well, the, the, so the, those were the drawings and I did a painting and Ana Teresa Fernandez was like, the painting needs more color. But I okay. had already gotten previous advice that those weren't enough from other people as well. So, so, so yeah, exactly that you, you said, um, and correct me if I'm getting the story wrong, but um, that, that you ended up, you know, at first you were frustrated with that advice, but then at a certain point you actually felt yourself that those paintings or drawings um, were not enough and that you needed to push them. Um, and one person asked if you could talk about this and um, what makes a work enough or not enough, especially with regard to, you know, your subject matter and the meaning you are trying to convey? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's very personal from artist to artist. Um, it will vary because some things I've, even things that I'm making now, people are saying like, you know, you have to do it differently or whatever. And we really take the advice that we want to and we, we apply it or we don't. And I think that it takes a while to learn how to do that because, we want to satisfy different assets of our, our, of our networks. And um, for me, those first drawings, I was really happy with them and I liked them, but I also knew that they weren't, they weren't the, at the vibrancy that I wanted them to be, right? Um, I think that the work that I made during the fires is actually more dark 
than that were the brown on brown drawings. Um, but there's a vibrancy to the energy and the color that was not there before. Uh, and that's what I that's what I was trying to reach, right? That's where Ana Teresa Fernandez came in and she made those comments and it really made me realize that with this experience of being undocumented, there is a sense of invisibility and there is a sense of hiding and being protected. But beneath all that, there's this beautiful cultural richness that I wanted to bring out that wasn't coming up in those brown on brown drawings um, that I think I'm achieving now with these like very colorful dark paintings. Um, and they look very black, but they actually have no black in them. It's just layers of of different colors back and forth, um, pushing the energies. And so that's really where I feel like I achieved what I wanted to bring forward. Uh, and it took a little bit of time, but I was able to do it. Yeah, I love how you were describing um, the paintings that have the, the many, many layers of oil. And so, you know, a scene over a screen, they're invisible in a way. Um, and, and so you have to actually, I love the idea that you have to be physically you know, so close to it in order to see the nuance of it. It just, that speaks a lot to, you know, everything you're talking about and also our experience of suddenly being forced to, you know, communicate with one another online. There's a lot of good, you know, we get to see it, but we don't, there's something that's missed in, in like a human to human real experience. So we only, we only have a couple more minutes. That went really fast. So, um, there's more, let's see, I'm trying to think of a one of which one of these. I think um, since, you know, since this is a university and, and students, you know, students are your audience, I think maybe this is a good question to end on that. Um, how has your experience in art school or just as a student shaped who you are as an artist? Um, wow. <laughs> uh, so I think art school specifically has been extremely difficult for me. Um, especially, and this is, you know, I could go on about this for a long time, but um, I'll just sum it up really quickly. Being, uh, and again, I'm super transparent. So I am only, I was only able to attend CCA and for undergrad and for grad school because of the scholarship that they offered me. Um, and it was a full ride both times. Um, but I also knew that I was giving, giving up a lot of, um, I was giving I was giving them what they wanted, right? I was giving them the diversity that they're looking for, um, the numbers that they want to tick off. Because at the end of the day, they are an institution that is making money, um, and it's it's a private institution at that. And so I knew that I was being used for certain things and for marketing, um, and and I knew that I, that was my exchange, right? And that was what it came down to the to the financial exchange with CCA it was really that I, I would do the talks I would do whatever they wanted me to do and I would be there and um, it took me a long time to understand that that was my my role uh, but once I embraced it I was like okay well if you're using me for this this is how I'm I, I need this from you right and I was able to, to to have demands and to get my needs met as well so I think that that has shaped me because I I know how to use my position um, and take advantage of it, right? And so as someone who's been taken advantage of my entire life, I can finally flip the roles and say, okay, well, if you want your diversity numbers, if you want this audience, if you want whatever, I need this in return. And, and I think like really being clear about what you need is something that a lot of people can't do. And so that has shaped the way that I network with other people and the way that, you know, when I go to gallery openings, I'm very forward. I'm, I'm very, I, I know how to deal with people, which it, it takes a long time to get there. But if, it, if you want to be in this industry, you have to be, you have to be really good at networking and you have to know what you're doing and how you're talking to people and, you know, being friendly with other people, even if you're not fond of them, it's, it's all a game, really. It comes down to that. Um, but when it comes to, to like education in the art school, that was also difficult for me because again, I was, you know, one of two, maybe brown, um, brown bodies in a classroom. Right. And so then we're having the same conversations that we just had about appropriation and about, you know, how we approach art making and uh, everyone turns to you for the answer, right? Everyone turns to you to talk about, um, the long, long history of brown bodies in the art. And it just, it's a lot of responsibility. I, a lot of the times I found that I didn't even want to answer, right? 
I felt so frustrated both not only with my peers, but also with my professors because there was a lack of understanding there. And I don't blame them because I also know their social political position that has led them there where they haven't been able to understand all of the nuances of appropriation and, and of black and brown bodies. And so it was a lot of the times I just felt like, what am I doing here? You know, I have, I have this life experience that has taught me so much um, that I almost feel like I have nothing to learn here. But at the end of the day, I've built an amazing network of, of friends and colleagues that I am honored to work with. And it's been just such a beautiful experience to, to be able to have my, my really close friends that I can call up on and have critiques with on Zoom. You know, um, and I, 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 my entire art school career, I was told like, keep the, your friends really close. You'll really need them. You know, when you leave art school and when you leave your educational, um, a career when it's over you're gonna you're gonna count on those people and i can't i can't even stress how important that has been especially right now you know reconnecting with everyone from my undergrad and 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 keeping those conversations going and what we're making and how we're making and pushing them forward regardless of who they are that has been just super super helpful um i think there's something to be said too about being in the bay area and what it means to be an art school in san francisco and to be you know the the economy that we're in and it's just, and being in tech and there's so much there, so much influence, but it has all been really great and it, it went by too quick, you know, it's over now and yeah, I don't know. Well, I wish I, I wish there was more time because I want to know what's next and all that, but I, I have to say thank you so much. This has been a really powerful hour, powerful hearing your story and I know for a fact that you've, this has been really influential for a lot of our students. So. So thank you very, very much. And um, I guess we'll wrap this up and I'll see you in our separate Zoom meeting for the student critiques. Awesome, thank, thank you. you all so much. Have a great one and stay safe. Take care.